This lecture is by Dr. Alok Kumar Gupta. Viewers, <clears throat> welcome to my fifth lecture on Plato. In this lecture, through the help of slides, I am going to explain you the three prima facie theories of justice. Prima facie because these were the theories of justice which were existing in those days or during the days of Plato and Socrates in the Greek world, especially Athens. So, what are those theories of justice which Plato has refuted before giving his own theory of justice an ideal state where justice prevails? So, uh, these three primary theories of justice which have been enumerated by Plato refutes, Socrates refutes or Plato refutes each of them one by one through dialectical method. Their traditional theory of justice as enunciated by Cephalus and his son Polymarchus, radical theory of justice as enunciated by Thrasymachus, a sophist, pragmatic theory of justice as enunciated by Glaucon and Adimantus, who were Plato's brother, brothers. <coughs> These, this piece of information I have already shared with you in my previous lecture. So let us take, a, take the first one, traditional concept of justice. So first theory of justice that, that we come across in book one of Republic is by the theory of, uh, is the theory of Cephalus or by Cephalus, in whose house the conversation or the discussion has ensued between Socrates and rest of the participant. So Cephalus first enunciates his own theory of justice, in which he says it lies in speaking the truth and paying your debts. After a little while, Cephalus retires from the discussion in order to look after the sacrifices and his place is taken by his son Polymarchus. And Polymarchus slightly modified the definition and says justice consists in giving to each man of what is proper to him. Thereafter, the discussion shifts from the use of the word proper or revolves around the use of the word proper and it ultimately leads to the view that justice is an art which gives good to friends and evil to enemies. So basically three definitions in this slide we come across. First one as given by Cephalus who says justice lies in speaking the truth and paying your debts. Then his son Polymarchus gives his first definition. Justice consists in giving to each man what is proper to him and then during the course of further discussion, he ends up uh, revising his definition as justice is an art which gives good to friends and evil to enemies. So remember, these are the three theories of justice which, we, which, which I have mentioned in this slide. And each of these could lead to multiple choice questions. Sometimes you will <clears throat> get in mains. It lies in speaking the truth and paying your debts. Explain. So, either way, <clears throat> you need to develop an understanding about this. Now, Socrates rejects this view through a dialectical method. Assuming justice is an art is fallacious because any art is capable of doing two opposite things. The doctor who has most capacity in preventing <coughs> has almost, uh, uh, sorry, has most capacity in creating diseases as well, which means the best guardian of a camp also possess the greatest, greatest capacity for stealing a march on the enemy, which basically means the person who can deliver best of the services can, delivers, can deliver you either way, in a positive way as well as in a negative way. So if justice is a capacity or accomplishment, it is capable no less than medical skill or military ability of being used in opposite directions. And the just man will be equally able to guard or to steal a deposit and be just or unjust at will. So justice as such is should be harmless or such is harmless as such is harmless 
इट कैन नेवर हार्म टू एनी बडी इट इज़ रैदर ए क्वालिटी ऑफ द सोल एंड हैबिट ऑफ द माइंड सो बेसिकली इट इट प्रोसीड्स इन अ वेरी लॉन्ग डिलीबरेशन थ्रू विच अलॉन्ग विच सॉक्रेटस जस्ट पोज ऑन गोज ऑन पोजिंग क्वेश्चन टू फर्स्ट सेफलास एंड देन टू पॉलीमार्कस एंड बाई वे ऑफ एग्जाम्पल्स ही हैज़ ट्राई टू एक्सप्लेन दैट वट यू इंटेंड टू मीन बाई जस्टिस इज नॉट इन रियलिटी इज द मीनिंग ऑफ जस्टिस सो द क्रक्स ऑफ द आर्ग्यूमेंट नंबर वन इज अपियरेंसेस आर ऑफ एन डिसेप्टिव विच मीन्स वी मे बी कंसिडरिंग समबडी एज ए गुड फ्रेंड बट इन रियलिटी दैट पर्सन मे नॉट बी आवर फ्रेंड ही इज अ फ्रेंड इन अपियरेंस ऑनली वेर एज ही इज वेरी एप्ट एट स्टेप स्टैबिंग एट बैक सो इफ वी से जस्टिस मीन्स गिविंग गुड टू फ्रेंड्स सो वट हैपन्स इज दैट द पर्सन इज नॉट माई फ्रेंड इन रियल सेंस ऑफ द टर्म फ्रेंड इन फैक्ट ही इज एन एमी एंड वाइल आई एम डूइंग गुड टू हिम इन फैक्ट आई एम डूइंग गुड टू एन एमी सो सिमिलरली इफ आई एम डूइंग इविल टू एन एमीज देन मे बी द पर्सन इज क्वाइट स्ट्रेट फॉरवर्ड ही कॉल्स स्पेड स्पेड ऑन माई फेस एंड दैट इज वाई आई कंसिडर हिम एन एमी वेर एज ऑन माई बैक ही हैज ऑल सॉर्ट्स ऑफ प्रेजेज अबाउट माई गुड क्वालिटीज सो अंडर सच सरकम स्टांसेस इफ आई एम थिंकिंग इविल ऑफ हिम इन फैक्ट ही इज अ फ्रेंड एंड आई एम ट्राइंग टू कॉज हार्म टू हिम सो If the friend is only a friend in seeming and an enemy in reality, and we end up giving good to friends, then uh, how justice would be there, and how just uh, I mean whether we can call it justice. So does it ma- mean one should follow the definition rigidly, even in such cases, and do him good, or may one use his discretion and do him evil? Doing then second argument is doing evil to enemy. even bitterest enemy is inconsistent with the most elementary conception of morality which means any person who is a moral person and if he is facing some sort of enmity from some corner from some person then he will never think of harming that person even if he prays to the god he will pray that god give sense to my enemy so that he ends up as a friend to me or at least he is not causing harm to me so what it means is that thinking of evil or thinking of doing evil to any person is against the very concept of morality so under any circumstances nobody could do evil to anybody if he is a just man or if he is concerned about justice so the concept of justice giving to each man what is due to him is not of universal application it is not true in all the cases there may be cases in which to adhere to the letter of this formula may involve the violation of the spirit of right and it is not right of course to restore a deadly weapon to a man after he has gone mad though the weapon was borrowed from him and the borrower owed it to him this is something i, I mean uh, socrates has used to refute or to contradict the definition of justice as given by cephalus where cephalus says doing good to friends and evil to enemy sorry paying debt to the person what we owe to the others so he says that suppose a person socrates contradicts it by saying or by giving example that suppose a person when he is in good mind has given a dagger or a knife to me to keep it in possession because he is he thinks that i can keep it in the best possible way i will take good care of it now this is a debt which i owe to him because the dagger belongs to him now he picks up a fight with somebody else and he is not in his right senses uh, after fight he comes back to me and ask asks me kindly return my dagger to me 
now i know that he is not in his right senses and he will end up doing harm to somebody and uh, the fact remains that i owe the dagger to him the dagger belongs to him but is is it justice on my part to hand over whatever i owe to him under such circumstances obviously not this has been accepted by polymarcus at a later stage so these are the uh, explanations through which socrates has refuted the definition given by cephalus and polymarcus so this concept of justice as doing good to friends and evil to enemies takes into view only the relations between the individuals on the individualistic grounds which means that justice is something which operates only between two individuals and ignores the social whole which is the groundwork of any theory of justice it is too narrow in its approach because uh, justice seems to operate only at the level of two individuals so according to this view whereas in real sense justice has a social dimension is a holistic term so this is what is the submission made by socrates <clears throat> now faced by these consequences polymarcus is led to abandon the definition of justice as the art of giving good to friends and evil to enemies and he conclu- plato concludes the argument with the suggestions that the definition must have been invented by a tyrant like periander or an absolute monarch like xerxes with a great opinion of his own power so this brings an end to the first theory of justice which proceeded by way of conversation between cephalus and polymarcus on the one hand individually and then uh, socrates on the other hand socrates ends up refuting the traditional theory of justice as enunciated by first cephalus and then polymarcus then thrasymachus was sitting by them sitting beside them and uh, in between he was also trying to make interference but he could not so by the end of the discussion thrasymachus was quite red faced and uh, he uh, <clears throat> makes a case whereby socrates he is trying to provoke socrates but socrates is very mild in his personality and is and very cool and calm in his disposition so rather than getting provoked by thrasymachus he asked thrasymachus that what uh, i have failed to understand what justice is so thrasymachus it would be great of you if you could tell us what justice is so the theory of justice that thrasymachus enunciates has been branded or has been called as radical theory of justice by later commentators so he represents or thrasymachus represents the new and radical view of the late 5th century bc and he looks at justice from the standpoint of an unconventional immoralism he does not believe in moral obligation and according to thrasymachus justice is the interest of the stronger as and supreme authority lies with the state so everything that a state does is just so obeying the state obeying the government is or will lead to justice this is what thrasymachus means to say so this proposition of thrasymachus later during the course of discussion breaks into two principles number one is justice is identified with potentia which means the surest the strongest is surest to get what he wants right is identical with right with might which basically means that one who is strongest within the community is surest to get what he or she wants which means what prevails is might is right so as the government is the strongest in the state whatever the rulers will do will amount to be just so the standard of action for a man living in a community is thus according to thrasymachus the will of a ruler who wills his own good so justice for every person living in the state is to obey the government which means to seek the interest of the ruler or to promote to protect the interest of the ruler 
and if the citizens they protect the interest of the ruler by obeying their dictates only then the justice prevails this is what thrasymachus means to say so it is unjust on part of the subjects to pursue their own interest they should always pursue the interest of the ruler now uh, socrates through good amount of debates damages this theory of uh, thrasymachus this theory of justice of thrasymachus and that prompts thrasymachus to further revise his definition and he ends up revising it as injustice is better than justice so in book 1 itself <coughs> the three definitions that we read about cephalus and polymarchus and two definitions that we are reading about thrasymachus are present and their refutations also so every person would like to foster his own interest but as justice for the people is to fulfill the interest of the ruler ruler alone nobody would like to go according to justice so to be just in the popular sense is a means to the satisfaction of the ruler this is what thrasymachus means to say and to be unjust in the popular sense is to act for their satisfaction of own self or one self so the true standard of every man's action is to satisfy himself and hence injustice and not justice is the real virtue and the true wisdom for all sensible men this is what thrasymachus means to argue so he ends up saying that injustice is better than justice and the unjust man is wiser than the just and he further clarifies its meaning that a person is fully justifying justified in disobeying the laws of the state if such disobedience promotes his own self interest so now see both these definitions have been refuted by socrates on these grounds number 1 the justice can never be the interest of the stronger in the sense that government is an art now what it means is that <coughs> any art is practiced is used for the sake of improving the object on which it is used because here it is written all art is <coughs> sorry <coughs> for the sake of the perfection of the material it touches and handles and not for the sake of the artist himself so socrates argues that all arts are called into existence by defects in the material by which they deal which means if a doctor is pra practicing the art of medicine he is practicing on a patient and patient means the real condition of that individual who is being termed as patient has gone down in terms of perfection he is now less perfect he has developed certain defects so the physician attempts to remedy the defects of the body and teacher those of the mind means teacher teaches a student to train the mind to stimulate the mind in the right direction to make it increasingly progressive not digressive so the aim and object of every art is the well being of its material the perfect teacher for instance is he who had remedied all the defects and elicited all the possibilities of his people's mind or his students mind so this is the case that socrates is building and uh, now he says since the ruler in the state being the strongest as thrasymachus has post will try to fulfill fulfill his own interest but he practices the art of ruling or government and so this art of ruling on government will always try to perfect the material that is the subject on which he is practicing the art of ruling so he never does anything in his own interest as he is an artist artist because he is practicing the art of ruling or governance so the ruler so far as he acts as a ruler and in accordance with his art is absolutely unselfish his one aim is the well being of the citizens who are committed to his care 
So the just man is bound to be in a better position than the unjust because he knows the limitations as he follows the old Delphic teaching and recognizes the need of acknowledging a limit. Now see the first one, he has refuted on the <clears throat> basis of the argument that government in this is an art. Now the second one, that justice is injustice is better than justice. He is now refuting by making another case or by giving another example. Here he is saying the just man is bound to be in a better position than the unjust because he knows his limitations too. So just man would never compete with a just man, rather would cooperate with a just man and would always be try to be better than an unjust man. So this is the thing that he knows his limitations and uh, he recognizes the need of acknowledging a limit. He seeks indeed to compete with others, but he does not like the unjust man seek to compete with everybody. So what the, the other thing that Socrates is trying to say or has said that an unjust man will compete with both a just man as well as an unjust man. So he seeks to compete with everybody or to compete for the mere sake of competition. So competition in itself is not his aim. <clears throat> his aim is absolute excellence. He only competes with those who fall short of that. And he only competes with them as it were incidentally. Not because he loves competition but because he loves excellence. So a just man always moves towards excellence. So <clears throat> if he observes some excellence in a just in another just man, he will try to learn from it, cooperating with him. <clears throat> but he will never compete with him because competis, competition is not his cup of tea or not his idea, not his personality. He is not, uh, he is not in love with competition, but he is cooperating, he is trying to learn from the just man because he loves excellence. He wants to be like him or maybe <coughs> better than him. So his aim is to do better than the bad, but not do better than the good with whom he is perfectly content to be equal and whom he is happy enough to be like. So when you set a benchmark for yourself, you try to achieve that benchmark. It may be a person. So you want to be like that person. So you try to be better than a bad man, but you always try to be like a good man if you are a just man. This is what Socrates is trying to or as Socrates has said, to refute this argument that a just man and an, un an unjust man is better than a just man. So he is happier and stronger than the unjust man uh, because the un uh, he tries to acquire virtue and virtue consists in adequate discharge of his du duties, his duties. So it is his duty to obey the state. This principle is also not of universal application. There should not be duplicity of standards, one for the ruler, another for the subjects. So Thrasymachus does not give any rational argument why it should be just for the ruler to get his own and yet at the same time unjust for others to do the like. So what it means is that what is true of one must be true of the rest which means there cannot be different standards for the rulers and the subjects. And uh, rulers practices the art of ruling for bettering the life of the ruled. So what it means is that ruler is trying to protect and promote the interest of the ruled rather than trying to do something or trying to act, practice his art of ruling to serve his or her own interest. So this is the case that he has tried to advance, the argument he has tried to advance. Another argument that, that he advances that a just man would always like to be another just man. Right? And would always try to be better than an unjust man. 
whereas on the other hand unjust man would like to be better than or like to be bigger than both an unjust man and a just man so unjust man loves only competition he competes for the sake of competing whereas whereas a just man does not loves competition he loves excellence that is why he wants to be like the another just man but not uh, compete with the just man to be better than him so this is what he has uh, tried to argue and uh, <clears throat> such a concept of justice can never be the true principle of society such an extreme individualism will reduce the society to pieces and such a society is no society at all in which the individuals try to disobey the law if they can be free from punishment and obey the law only if they are caught hold of by the ruler so <clears throat> socrates has concluded like this that uh, the what the thrasymachus is trying to propagate through those two definitions that justice is the interest of the stronger and that injustice is better than justice or an unjust man is better than the just man is fallacious is uh, grossly wrong and it is too individualistic so this type of justice if it allow it allows to exist if it allows to if it is allowed to prevail in any society the society will go to pieces and that will be no society so then comes the three third theory which with which the book 2 of republic begins and uh, the later commentators on the book republic they have branded it as pragmatic concept of justice as enunciated by glaucon and <clears throat> this definition of justice is that justice is an artificial thing the product of social convention there being no justice in the state of nature state of nature and <clears throat> nature of state they differ i mean both these phrases as a student of political science you should science you should keep in mind are totally different nature of state we talk about once a state has come into existence and when we use this terminology state of nature we are talking about a <clears throat> a hypothetical situation when there is no state there is no organized life that is called as state of nature right and <clears throat> by whatever means from the state of nature when we enter into a state then we talk about nature of the existing state so this definition says there being no justice in the state of nature which means there when there were no organized life no pol politically politically organized community there was no justice the other meaning of this definition is that justice is the child of fear and is based on the necessity necessity of the weaker and the interest of the stronger as thrasymachus would have it so basically what it means to uh, what uh, glaucon means to say is that justice is sprang out of a particular situation and the situation was that many of the weak individuals they combined together against the strength of the few means majority was weak in the community and few stronger people were trying to dominate over them so these weak people they came together and they started talking about justice that there should be justice because justice means there would be rules regulations laws norms and the stronger will also be motivated will be forced to obey those rules regulations so that there is justice and order in the social life in the community life so basically justice or the idea of justice or the concept of justice emanated 
थ्रू एन एग्रीमेंट ऑफ द वीक पीपल एमोंग दीक वीक पीपल सो बेसिकली वॉट इट मीन्स इज दैट दी फाइंड इन ग्लॉकन्स डेफिनेशन द ट्रेसेस ऑफ सोशल कॉन्ट्रैक्ट थेरी विच वी विल बी डिस्कसिंग लेटर वेन वी कम टू सोशल कॉन्ट्रैक्ट थेरी सो ग्लॉकन्स आर्ग्यूमेंट लीड्स टू टू कंक्लूजन्स वन दैट द स्टेट इज बॉन्ड ऑफ ए कॉम्पैक्ट based on mutual fear and not on universal and moral principles as i said the weak came together and they tried to talk about evolve justice so it is it was the mutual fear of these weak individuals weak members of the community which led to justice it uh, justice is not something which is of a universal or moral प्रिंसिपल सेकेंड स्टेट इज ए कन्वेंशनल एंड नॉट ए नेचुरल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन विच मीन्स स्टेट केम आउट ऑफ सम काइंड ऑफ ए कॉन्ट्रैक्ट और इवॉल्व आउट ऑफ सम काइंड ऑफ ए कॉन्ट्रैक्ट रेदर दैन स्टेट हैज इवॉल्व नेचुरली ओवर ए पीरियड ऑफ टाइम सो स्टेट इज नॉट ए नेचुरल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन इट इज कन्वेंशनल इट हैज बीन क्रिएटेड एट सम पॉइंट ऑफ हिस्ट्री बिकॉज ऑफ mutual fear of some weak individuals so such a concept of justice and state resembles the modern social contract theory as i told you so such a theory can be criticized on the same ground on which social contract theory is criticized but socrates rejection of this theory is very simple and uh, according to socrates in this concept as well as in other two theories which we are discussed so far there is common line of error and this common line of error is that they they have all treated justice as if it were something external which means it has been imported into within the community by the community or it is a convention which means they have entered into some kind of agreement or a contract that let us bring justice so justice is an importation according to this definition so just socrates say just where a justice on the other hand is rooted in human mind it is not external it is an intrinsic virtue it is something eternal and justice does not depend upon its origin uh, for its origin upon a chance convention that at some point of history the people out of their mutual fear came together and they constituted a politically organized society where justice where they imported justice this is what is the meaning of origin upon a chance convention so socrates has denied that justice is conventional and therefore something external it neither it depends neither upon convention nor upon external force so these these are the three theories of justice which we come across in book 1 and half part of the book 2 before socrates proceeds towards building an ideal state he refutes each of these three existing theories in those days athens one by one so from next lecture onwards we will enter into plato's ideal state and plato's theory of justice thank you very much bye bye